Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope that you are enjoying the meeting. Um, thank you for the endurance. I know it's Thursday. I know that the beach is very close to us, so thank you for, for being here. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor So Wai La from Ohio University. Um, Professor La is a, a, a professor of physics at Ohio University and a research staff member in the Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Division at Argonne National Laboratory. He has also served as a director of Condensed Matter and Surface Program at Ohio University and as a group leader of Electronic and Magnetic Materials and Devices Group and Quantum and Energy Materials Group in Argonne, in Argonne National Laboratory. His research is focused on nanoscience and emerging quantum phenomena at the atomic and molecular level using various scanning probe methods, including low, temper low temperature scanning tunneling microscopy, spin polarized STM, and synch synchrotron X-ray STM. Um, along his career, he used atomic and molecular manipulation schemes on material surfaces to understand fundamental processes in single atom manipulations, as well as applications of these techniques to molecules adsorbed on material surfaces. He has demonstrated a single molecule Allman reaction and manipulation of single molecule condor resonances, as well as operation of individual molecular machines and machines uh, assemblies on material surfaces using atomic molecular manipulation schemes. And today, uh, he will talk about quantum molecular machines. So please welcome Professor Hila. Thank you very much for being here. So. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice introduction. And, uh, and also, I would like to thank the um, organizing committee for IMRC uh, for inviting me here. Uh, this has been a long process because of COVID, and uh, we have been postponed for a few times. So what I am going to tell you today, or I'm going to entertain you as the last uh, plenary lecture of this Congress, as you see that the title, uh, Quantum Molecular Machine, in fact, it, they will be just also in the action. Uh, what you are seeing in this picture is a little molecular motor in operation, um, and that's about uh, two nanometers, as you see in the scale. So here are the plan of my talk. I'm going to introduce you a little bit extensively about the techniques that we are going to uh, operate the molecular machines. And then I'm going to talk about five separate topics, mostly the molecular motors. Uh, some of those topics at the last are not published yet. So those are the latest results. So let me start. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so let me start with the uh, introduction. <clears throat> we know that molecular machines are everywhere in the nature. In our body, we have natural molecular machines up to 10,000, more than 10,000. We have it. And every day, we know that uh, Molecular machines are working. Even they are working right now in your body when you are listening this talk. So every day about 70 to 80 billions of the cells and the DNA has to be repaired by the molecular machines. And I borrow this from the web. Uh, these are the little molecular machines. They are repairing and rebuilding uh, the, uh, the DNA inside our body. That's the reason that we just keep living every day. <clears throat> so that naturally, those molecular machines exist everywhere, and they are really fascinating. Now, <clears throat> of course, there are a group of scientists 
and this is a, a pretty large community now, are trying to develop the artificial machines. That is that we want to mimic the nature, the natural machines, and then to create uh, artificial machines. So here, if you Google it, I just Google it and put it here, you can find it. There are tons of uh, uh, beautiful images inspiring the structures. And the molecular machines mostly are either the rotary devices, that means that they are rotating, or the linear devices like you can transfer from one place to another or a combination of both. And now they can be built either by biological means or chemical means, okay? But there is one problem here. What I'm showing you, the movies and all these beautiful structures are cartoons. Can we see them? Can we operate them one at a time? If we want to develop these to further advance the techniques, we need to see them and we need to operate them. We need to understand how they operate. What are the energetics? Can we use them in solid-state devices in your cell phone, for example? Those are the ideas which comes up with these projects. And the research on the molecular machine, of course, was uh, celebrated by the Nobel Prize in 2016. These three scientists got their work on the artificial molecular machines. So in the machines that we are talking about, another cartoon I borrowed from the web, the molecular machines that we know operate in, we call it the classical regime, classical mechanics in physics. That's the U or I. We understand if I jump, I will fall down here because of the gravity. Those are all classical mechanics. Simply because the sizes of these molecular machines are in a micrometer or submicron scales. But if the machines are getting much smaller, like in the nanometer regime, then it, many of them no longer follows the classical mechanics. They start to follow the quantum, quantum mechanics. So the laws of quantum mechanics detect how they operate. So this is the part which I am going to discuss and development of a new little molecular machines. And the questions that I want to answer is can we image individual molecular machines? Or, and can we control their operations? How can we determine the energetics, like the energy to operate? How charge and the energies transfer inside a molecular machine? And can we operate not just one, but many machines simultaneously? Can we use them for applications outside of the standard, for example, spintronics, or even for quantum information science using the molecular machines? Now, all these things to answer, we first need an instrumentation method that we can uh, probe. So it's a capable instrument. So let me introduce a few things about the, the scanning tunneling microscope. Many of you know the scanning tunneling microscope. Typically, we use a very sharp needle, and that needle is positioned less than one nanometer from the surface. And if you apply the bias, we have a quantum tunneling taking place. And if you scan the dip by controlling the height, we get line by line structures. And if you stack it, we can get atomic resolutions. Like we can see the atoms, we can see the molecules. But the techniques that we are going to use for molecular machine research is not just the imaging. It's called manipulation. We can, in fact, use that little ne uh, needle. It's like a tweezer. And we can go and interact with the atoms and molecules, that using the forces. Or we can inject the tunneling electrons, and we can transfer the energy into the molecule in very specific way with subatomic precision. Or we can also use the electric field generated between the tip and the sample to manipulate. And I'm going to use all of them that uh, to study the molecular machines. <clears throat> so let me, please bear with me. I will a little bit try to explain to you. 
The first technique called atom manipulation was actually invented quite some time ago by IBM, by Don Eigler. And he wrote that very famous IBM logo with individual atoms. And these pictures you may have known in the web, these are called quantum corals. By putting the atoms, positioning precisely, you can build the uh, quantum corral. Here, the wave things that you see are electrons because electrons behave like a wave in this scale. In this technique, <clears throat> what we do is that we approach the SDM dip very close to the atoms or the molecule, and then uh, we laterally move it, that we can precisely position at atomic scale individual atoms. The right side is an example from my group a long time ago that we have shown here. And what you are seeing is that we are pulling out the atom from a cluster and positioning the atoms to build this little quantum, uh, uh, we call it the quantum corel, but this is to shoot the molecules. Okay, so here again, so we started from the, the removing uh, atoms from the clusters and we can move it around to build desired uh, the structures. Now, atomic manipulation is fascinating, and, but this is no longer the high technology. In my lab in 2009, that's already something like 13 years ago, we opened up for physics open house at Ohio University, and we have invited six to 12 years old kids to come over to the lab, and I give them the task here, this is the atomic bus, to draw with the atoms little school bus. So these little kids here are the lining up and my grad students are guiding them to build. So each kid move one atom. So this is their work and <clears throat> here it is, the little movie of atom manipulation building atomic school bus. So even uh, six to 12 years old kids now can build and move the individual atoms with atomic precision. The second technique I want to use is called inelastic tunneling. That is basically to tell, to transfer the energy, electron energy into the specific position. This was first demonstrated by Professor Wilson Ho, the time he was in a Cornell. And by injecting the tunneling electrons, we can vibrate, we can rotate, or we can even create a bond association or bond association or bond formation. There are many things that we can do by transferring the energy. The process works following. We inject the electrons, the electrons are captured in the unoccupied orbitals of the molecules. At that point, you transfer the energy. Then the molecule use that energy and one of those things could happen. And this, we want to use it for molecular machines. Now the process is even nicer. We can understand how many electrons that we use by using this equation, very simple. R here is the rate of energy transfer. I is the tunneling current to the power N. Here is with the red letter. N will tell you the number of tunneling electrons that we are using it for energy transfer. Here is an example in my group that we published 2006, long time ago. We have little chlorophyll molecules and then we inject the tunneling electrons and we can switch the uh, conformation of the chlorophyll. So here we can know when it switch, just by looking at the current, you see the abrupt change, it switch. We can leave it, you see the two step signal that is switching back and forth, or we also measure the energy required to switch by ramping the bias, by increasing the voltage, you see here around uh, zero point, uh, six, I guess, <clears throat> and that, uh, yes, sorry, 0 0.8 uh, <clears throat> electron volt, then the, the molecules start uh, switching. We can also measure the number of switching events as a function of time. If you plot, you get the exponential decay. From that, we can get the rate. If you plot the rate as a function of the energy, uh, the current, the slope would tell the number of tunneling electrons used for energy transfer. Here in the case, slope is one. We use one single, uh, a single tunneling electrons to switch this event. Okay, so here is a little movie. This was a pretty famous. It was in a Paris fashion show with the catwalk, with dancing the chlorophyll. 
<clears throat> we actually purposely induced by tunneling electrons to create this movie. So now I have already explained to you, I have the tool that I'm going to use it, and we are basically like we can actually reach at the atomic scale. So let's try to see how do we solve these problems. And there are, of course, a number of already having a publications of the uh, different types of molecular motors or molecular cars, including the Professor Faringer's publication in Nature got the Nobel Prize, these uh, little nano cars, they actually are using the scanning tunneling microscope to image or to manipulate. So this is not a Superman task. It's, you can't do it alone. Okay, so this is a very big task. So we form a cross-Atlantic, a cross-Pacific collaboration, and uh, it's already for more than 10 years that we set up this collaboration. And my group at Ohio University, we do all the characterizations. And then my colleague, Aguine Ripon, Professor Aguine Ripon, he was originally from France, and he moved to uh, Nara Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. And uh, uh, they, he basically do all the synthesis to synthesize the molecular machines. And then Christian Yoshin Group from uh, CNRS, French National Research uh, uh, Institute, and uh, Simis, uh, he did the, uh, he's doing the calculations. And recently, my uh, former uh, group member, Professor Ango from University of Illinois at Chicago joined for the calculations, for the density functional theory calculations. So these are the experts with the different areas, okay? I'm a physicist, Guina is chemist. He's also happened to be the PhD, former PhD student of Nobel laureate Professor Javier Sovich, uh, a Nobel laureate for molecular machines. And Christian is electronics engineer and chemist, and he's in chemical engineering angle. So we combine all the hands together to build up the structures. So let me start with my first presentations, which is a little molecular motors, which we control uh, directional rotation precisely. And these are specially designed molecules, and let me explain it. This was published already some time ago in 2013 in Nature Nanotechnology. So this molecule is basically has a structures, which is the inspiration of this I borrow from the Google, from the web. We have a rotor which has a five arms. We have a tripod, and we do have the, uh, the linkage between them. So the design is following. We call it the molecular tripod. And when we deposit these molecular motors, it has to stick correctly. That means that the position correctly upside, okay, so upright, sorry. So what we need is the, 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 the lag has to be sticking. So we put here sulfur groups in order to stick on the gold substrate that we are going to use. If we want to use a silicon, we can change that to the oxygen, for example. So this is very nice. And we have the uh, rotator or rotor, which is five arms, five blades. We, by purpose, truncate it, cut it one, so that we know, because of the asymmetry, we know when it rotates. The end, we have the ferrocene group, which is iron atoms. These are initially designed so the electric field, when we apply the molecule motor, we rotate. As you know, if you have a rotating part, if you have a stationary part you want to link together, you need the ball bearing. So if you're an engineer, you know that immediately. So here, we have the rotating part, we have a stationary part, so we use a single atom, a ruthenium atom, as an atomic ball bearing. When we want combine it together, we get this kind of a molecular motor, a multi-component. This molecule should be staying upright on the surface, and it should operate. So when we deposited these molecules on gold 111 substrate, so this is the background, it's a single crystal gold 111. These are the well-known, it's known as a herringbone surface reconstruction, these lines are. And we took this image around 80 Kelvin, as you can see that we have already, the motors are rotating, so they are already working. We were very happy because they are already operational, but we want to understand how they rotate, and we want to control it, not just seeing their rotation. 
So what we do, okay, so this is a joke. It looks like a Mexican hat, you know, an appearance. So what we do, we cool it down the sample to the 80 Kelvin. Because we freeze the thermal excitation, this rotating molecular motor is stopped rotating. And you can see like this kind of five lobes. And we can identify by comparing with the five, I label one, two, three, four, five, it's here. OK, so now we can uh, stop the rotation fine. We can image. But we are imaging from the top. We need to prove that entire molecule is intact. The legs should be underneath. So in order to see the legs, we try to blow up the top part by electric field manipulation. So we increase the, the bias of the tunneling microscope at the tip. And by increasing, as you can see, around negative 2.3, we can repeatedly break the top part. So when we blow up the top part, you can see that underneath is a tripod is there. So we know that the molecule is intact. And we give these structures of measurement, basically the, the absorption structures, to the theorists. And this is the calculated structures, except the shades. This is not a cartoon. This is the calculated results. So our molecular model looks like this, with one nanometer tall, two nanometer wide. OK, so now we have the molecular model. We want to understand how can we control this uh, machine. It's rotation. So at 5 Kelvin, they don't rotate. So we can inject the tunneling electrons, use inelastic electron tunneling process I have explained to you already. By means of the electron energy transfer, we can uh, rotate stepwise. Why stepwise? Because these are, they follow the quantum mechanics. It's not the continuous. It, it moves stepwise. So this is what we did. We have an example of molecular motor. It looks like this. The background is a Herrimo reconstruction. And uh, we inject the tunneling electrons. And during the period, we fix the tip positions so the tip is not moving. But we are recording the current as a function of time so that we can follow what happens, the dynamics of this molecular motor. And then when we finish, we took the image. We see that you see the background is the same, but the motor is now rotated. Okay? So then from the current profile with the height, we can tell how they rotate, and we can follow the dynamic. Now we count how many electrons that we are using for this rotational process by measuring uh, the uh, rotational events as a function of time. They always follow the exponential plot. But if you change the tunneling current, the rate changes because you change the number of electrons transferring or passing through the molecule. Those are the, you change the rate. From these four rates as a function of uh, uh, the uh, current, here, log, and this is the logarithmic plot. The slope would tell us the number of electrons that we use for operation of this molecular motor. Here we got the slope is one again, so I can tell we use one single electron to inject into the molecular motor and let it rotate. Okay, so the next step is can we control the directional rotation of this little motor? And we can, when we inject to the I show with the location at the green dot here. That is the truncated arm. We, we position the tip and inject the electrons. The motor will rotate the clockwise. If we inject the location of one of the four other arms, complete arms, I show here one of the arms with the red. If we inject the tunneling electrons, motor will rotate counterclockwise. And we can repeat that all the time as we will. And uh, you see the clockwise, more clockwise, going backward and back and so on. So we can uh, rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise in a controlled manner. Now we need to understand how do we control it. We need to explain it. So what you are seeing here is the experiment here is with the yellow and the red are the simulated or calculated images of the molecular motor at the different angle. Now, in order to explain that how do we control it in the direction, we need to understand the rotational potentials. Here I'm going to show you with the five arms rotor with the three legs, 
if you rotate complete one turn 360 degrees, we are going to cross a 15 potential well. And that 15 potential well is shown here. And it turns out that the shape of the potentials appear asymmetric, like sawtooth-like potentials. Those are the very important part in this rotational process. Because if you want to rotate from one uh, um, energy minima to the next step, it has to pass this barrier. But the barrier is not symmetric. So if you excite this, we have a 50-50 chance to go to the left and the right. If you go to the right, you end up into the next potential well. That means it's rotate. If you go to the left, it ends up the same place. Then it will not rotate. That's the way that we are making a directional a rotation. Now when we look it back to the, the real motor, it turns out that the location of the truncated urn is, of course, is still following the, uh, the sawtooth-like potential, although they are not symmetric, while the complete urn is also like sawtooth potential, but the opposite sawtooth. That's the reason that when we inject the electrons here or here, it will go either left or the right. So here is the uh, mechanical movement of this molecular motor that we uh, did by means of the calculations. <coughs> Excuse me. And please notice a lot of movement at the leg here. And you see that the legs <coughs> are very flexible when we are, are manipulating, we are rotating this. And this calculation was done by 0 0.01 degree. It took six months to calculate by using the supercomputers. OK, so <clears throat> now this is nice. We can explain it, what's happening. But we were not satisfied. As I told you before, we want to directly detect this flexibility. We want to know a little more. So can we detect this movement of of these legs directly. Yes, we can do that, and I'm going to show in the next part of the talk. This was published in 2019 in HR Communications. So what we do is that now we need to turn it down, the upside down, the molecular motor. So the leg is up, the previous part is down. To do that, we remove the ferrocene arms, and we put it only the bromines here. So this molecular motor previously reversed. When we put it on the goal, of course, a sulfur like to stick on the gold, but we have only three sulfur. But also the bromine can interact with the gold, but we have five bromine. So the bromine overpower the sulfur, and now the, our motor go opposite, right? So the leg, previous leg, tripod is now upside, upright. So we can control how do we absorb the molecular motor on the solid surfaces. And it looks like a molecular propeller, so that's why we name it a propeller. And it also chiral, and you will see that. So when we put it on goal 101, now this is type of the structure, so you will see. You will immediately notice that there are many little propellers with the three arms here, rotating arms. But immediately you will notice also some structures appear, the round shapes here I show with the arrow. They are actually rotating already. So they, OK, so that's good. They are functioning as a molecular propeller. Then the next step that we notice immediately is that, uh, OK, sorry. So here it is the uh, a stationary propeller, and this is when they rotate. Next thing that we recognize is, as I show here, with the white and the blue circles. Now, they are actually chiral. You will notice that they are like in a hand. One is a left, one is a right chiral. So the question here is, they are rotating. Will they follow their rotational direction based on the chirality? Can we control it? And also, can we understand the flexibility of this leg? Now it's becoming an arms of the rotating arms, three arms. OK, so this is a close-up image of the left and right chiral molecular propeller. <clears throat> now, interesting thing is that these molecules are not chiral in the gas phase because we have these five benzene rings are stained vertical. But when they absorb on the surface, that's changed. To understand that, we use the density functional theory calculations 
to uh, uh, geometrically relaxed calculations to calculate the structure of entire molecular propeller. These are the expensive calculations. And what we found here is very interesting that these five uh, benzene rings actually are forming like a pinion. And you see that right now they are tilted, all of them, to the right. So it looks like this. We have a five pinion underneath, and they, are, they should be guiding their rotational direction. Because of this tilting, they also becoming chiral. OK, so now we have a chiral, and 50-50 chance that they could be either right tilted or the left tilted. So the next step is what we do. We try to operate the machine by injecting the electric field. In this case, electric field, not injecting, I'm sorry. We apply the electric field, and then uh, we can see that molecule rotate. We can see the signature, the changes. And if we took the image, molecule has been rotated, so it's working. The next step that we want to measure is the energy of this molecular motor. How much energy is required to rotate? So what we did, we, we measured the threshold, the electric field, and then we changed the tip height, and we keep measuring it. And the plot here shows relative tip height as a function of the threshold voltage. The slope tells us that uh, uh, basically 0.25 volt per angstrom. From that, we can estimate the energy, electrical energy, stored in the molecular motor, which is about 0.66 electron volt. Now, I have told you before, we actually want to detect the flexing of the, the leg, the tripod, now which is becoming an arm of a molecular propeller. So we use the tip to laterally move. This is the technique for atomic manipulations. Now, we apply this to mechanically push the leg to detect how it moves. And this is showing here that we can rotate. And this is an example signature. So what you are seeing is the tip height signal as a function of lateral distance of the tip movement. Immediately, you will notice that although there are a lot of noise, there are dips I show with the red arrow here. And there are peaks I show with the black arrows here. And then there's abrupt change. How do we understand that? I can explain it to you. So number one, which is the first initial part, the tip is coming towards the molecular motor, molecular propeller, sorry. Nothing happened. When the tip is very closed, suddenly this arm is flexible, so it moves away from the tip. It just moves like that easily. Then the tip height is reduced, because the tip height tells you how far the tip and the propeller. Reduced means the current is reduced. That means that it's far away. And then it gets stuck with the pine ring underneath cannot, no longer flexible. At that point, we need to push with the force, the dip height increases. At number four, suddenly entire propeller rotate to the next potential well. Then it just drops down because molecule is basically, propeller arm is moved away from the tip. So this is, we again simulated with the density functional theory. As you are seeing that the flexibility of the, uh, the, the, the pine rings, it appear here. And not only that, we found that they follow the rotation based on the chirality. From that, we can capture directly how they rotate. As you see, left and right chiral molecular <coughs> propellers rotating based on their chirality. I will repeat that movie. And this is the first time that we can follow exactly how they move. OK. so. Now I have shown you that we can study the mechanical strength, how they rotate, they follow the chirality, those are all nice. Those are all nice. But what we want to do is, if we were to use these molecular machines for the real applications, we want to have it as a thin film, for example. The billions of them has to work as simultaneously together. So for that, we want to test how can we control these motors. Then we realized that in order to rotate for the motors, they need to communicate each other. So that we developed a technique that is, uh, was published in uh, Nature Nanotechnology, 2016. Now we designed a motor which has a dipole interaction. 
This molecular model has the leg, has a four legs. It looks like this. And the rotating arm, the rotor, has only two blades. But that two blades has an internal dipole by purposely built in. It has a large dipole moment of eight dBi by internal charge transfer. OK, and then we deposited these molecules, again, like before, these motors on the substrate. And we took the images, even at the 5 Kelvin, now they are rotating. We cannot freeze anymore. So we changed the substrate to the copper 111. In this case, now the molecule assemble. So now we see the beautiful structures with the hexagonal arrangement. We know that these are the molecular motors, but how do we understand these structures, what we are seeing? So we did calculate the STM images. This is the theoretical simulations of how it should appear. It appears that we don't see underneath because many of them are together. So we are taking the images from the top. What we are seeing, the two lobes actually coming from the tilted, vertically tilted, two pi ring. And from these two pi rings, we see two lobes. Not only that, their intensity is not the same. So this one is appear to be much deeper, uh, brighter than the other one. So we also know the direction of the dipole where it's pointing to just by looking at the two lobes, the big one to the small one, that's where the arrow is pointing. Now, when we look at the STM image, this is an experimental image with a color contrast to show how they line up. So all the molecular motors are not only assembled in hexagonal arrangement, but they are also pointing into the same direction to their dipoles. So this is very similar to the ferroelectric system that we have built with molecular motors. OK, so now I'm going to show you the operation of many molecular motors at the same time. So what you are seeing is the STM image. Now I show with the little arrows to guide your eyes. They are all pointing to the upward. Each one is about two nanometers in, uh, in the length. And this defect is for the landmark, OK, so eye guidance. In the next image, you see that now we have a large area has already rotated. We even form a kind of a boundary, a grain boundary between them. Okay, so there's a rotation. And we can do that also by the control way, just to show a close-up image here with a defect site as a landmark. We position the STM tip and apply the electric field again. Then the next something happened here around one volt. So we measure the energy to rotate. It's about one electron volt. And then we took the image again. We see that they all rotated to the clockwise direction. And here, the circle is a defect, which we use as a landmark. So we know that we are doing exactly at the same area. All right, now to understand that, I want to explain briefly with the Hamiltonian system. So here, if we look at it, it turns out that the kinetic energy part is very small. That's why I said it's a quantum. So in fact, the, the energy for kinetic energy for this uh, is only microelectron volt. So we cannot use as a standard mechanical engineering concept to understand these machines. We have to use the quantum mechanics or quantum mechanical engineering. Now, the most important part here, the electric field, and the dipolar energies are the two terms they are more important for the operation. So how things work is here. We never see that in this assembly, one motor only rotation. We can rotate all or none. Why is that? So when we look at the uh, dipole arrangement of hexagonal dipoles, okay, it's an arrangement. If we want to rotate only one dipole that's located at the center, what happened? It turns out that when the dipole rotate, the rest is remaining fixed. When it gets 180 degrees, now the, the dipolar energy terms increase. So there is a barrier, the price to pay if you want to rotate just one molecular motor. But what happens if you rotate all of them at once? So when you rotate all of them at once, what happens is that they cancel out each other and the net energy is zero. That means that uh, you don't have to pay the cost. So that's the reason that these molecular motors like to rotate all at once. It's like when we are driving all the cars with the same speed, you see the neighbor is stationary. That's the concept here. 
they all rotate with the same speed at collectively, and it should also be a simultaneously, although we cannot uh, say so precisely because we did not get the, the time sequence. Now, there is a one more thing that I need to add. When we look at the hexagonal arrangement of the molecular motors on the surface, when we are, we are, because we are using the electric field emanating from a single point source, so the electric field is emanating going along all the directions of this. Then what happened is that uh, any torque we have for anti-torque, you need the force, rotational force, or the torque in order to rotate. But all your torques cancel out, so molecular motors will not rotate in the network. However, if we create a defect site, now there is a torque is no longer canceled, there is the torque, net torque appear. So defects are very important to rotate this large array of network of molecular machines. Now we have here in the large area, it's about 50 nanometers, we have many molecular motors. I have a two defect sites. And also we have a steps. Steps also act like a defects. These are one-dimensional defects. And uh, in the next, you see that we have rotated this area. We have a, flat, a frustrating uh, uh, the motor in the, in the boundary. And then the next slide, again, we have in this area has been rotated. And so we, in that way, we can uh, creating the defects. We can uh, actually rotate. We have checked up to the 500 rotors to simultaneously rotate. With that, I move to the next part, okay? So now I have shown you about the mechanical rotations and also the network rotation. Can we also determine how the energy transfer inside a molecular motor? Now, when we inject the electrons, we are transferring the energy by means of an electron. We add the electrons and we can actually trace their uh, the status within the molecular motor, single molecular motor. How do we do that? So we can take the tunneling spectroscopy, we call it DIDV tunneling spectroscopy, and you see these kind of signatures, and I'm going to explain what are these. And these are very important signals that, that explain us what's happening. So what you see here is that like a little like a peak-like things and some kind of a dip-like things, and they also vary the intensity depend on the location. To understand that, I pull up one spectra here, and now I'm going to explain it. What are these? The first thing to understand is this part, which is the two dips appearance here, the W shape. Uh, in fact, it's not a W shape, one step down and one step up, combined with a peak. So we have a two information overlapping in one signature. So that's we need to understand. So in tunneling spectroscopy, when we measure the current voltage characteristic, if you take the first derivative, we call it the DIDV. It's just simple math. Any change that you see here will appear as a step, okay? Any step, if you take the second derivative, d 2 i by dv square, it will appear as either a peak or a dip, depend on the up or down step, okay? So now what we check is we take directly the second derivative, we see that down and up peak here. So we understand that this is coming from this kind of second derivative signature. Second derivative signatures are, we call it the vibrational spectroscopy. You can tell directly not only the type of the chemistry, also which modes are vibrating. And so when we measure it at the two points I show here with the red and the blue, and the signatures are here, you can see that we have a red and a blue curves they both have an energy approximately around 50 to 60 electron volt, both plus and minus. That turns out to be the ferrocene because we know there's a ferrocene um, position, and it's a ferrocene vibration. So we know that the ferrocene is vibrating when we inject the electrons into one electron into the system. What is the peak? Bear with me a little bit. The peak actually is a, a, a spin signature. That is, we call it the condo effect. In fact, what happened is we have three electrons on the gold 111 substrate. When we add one electron, there is a net spin in the electron. That spin of the electron interact with the uh, substrate, free electron spin. That effect, we call it the condo effect, which actually tell us that there is a net spin there. 
and how do we read it, we have to look at this curve. There are three possible possibilities. The peak show with the red, or the dip show with the blue, or in between by show with the green. All three are condo effect, and, uh, and which is determined by, we call it the Q values in this equation. I will not bore you in detail, but believe me that uh, if you see this, we can confirm this, uh, these are the condo effect also by other means. And then we know there is a net charge is there. So what happened here is that when we inject the tunneling electrons into the uh, molecular motor, and after injecting, suddenly there is a charges appear. Because electronic charge is not centralized into the injected place, it also spread over to its response for entire mo the molecular motor, especially from the ferrocene arms, because you have a net charge, which they don't like it. There is a Coulomb repulsion, and then there is a symmetry of the charges appear, so they become a magnetic entire molecular motor. So now we understand what we are seeing is that we have signature of vibration, signature of injecting the net charge into the molecule, and they cause together. Because we have injected the charge or the energy into the molecule, molecule dissipate that energy by vibrating, which, of course, energy is not enough to rotate. If the energy is enough to rotate, molecule dissipate, in this case, the motor dissipate by rotating, not vibrating. Okay, so now the, I, we want to trace, these are really uh, uh, tantalizing things that we are very interested in. Can we use the spins in molecular motors? Maybe we can build molecular qubits with the molecular motors or maybe for spintronic applications. What happens if we have a multiple magnetic centers? So with that in mind, we uh, basically designed and extended our molecular motor by adding additional five um, uh, the nickel pufferings here. And so the molecules becoming very big, this molecular motor for our scale. And it has 870 atoms and the mass of this amount of 6,162 uh, DA and diameter is about five nanometer. And it's, it's huge. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we can get, of course, uh, as usual, uh, we can get the images directly of this molecular motor. Now it should have uh, five magnetic centers. What happened in, uh, in, in these magnetic centers? To do that, we did the tunneling spectroscopy mapping, as shown here, and we took the 4,096 tunneling spectra, uh, the single point spectra across this area. It took the 50 hours, so we have to follow and simulate where we took the data in order to extract the information. And, uh, and during this, the drift of the system, because even though we are working at five Kelvin, if the drift is like approximately less than one angstrom per hour, it moves. 50 hours, so it's about less than five nanometers, or around five nanometers. Actually, it moves at 3.75 nanometer, 37.5 angstrom. So we need to figure out how this moves to make a correction so that we get the precise information. Then we pull out our data. At the, we can get the data for everywhere around this molecular motor. But we check first magnetic centers, what happening, what's happening. And what you are seeing here is a signature, again, I will tell you, it's a condo because they have magnetism, net spin now. And we have a five different looking shapes appear here. And then at the center also there is a one. Now, what are these? We can explain it because when we look at these molecular motors, the five arms are not, uh, they are not staying vertical. Each one of them are rotated. But the rotation is following. This arm is 35 degree. This arm is negative 35, it's a reverse. This is 65, this is negative 65. And then this is 50, it's separated. So when we look at the corner signatures, it appears that the 35 and minus 35 are actually opposite, as it should be in the rotational angle. And the same way, if you look at 65 and negative 65, okay, so they appear as a both dip, so if you reverse it, they should appear similar. 
And then the 50 appear as a peak. So we have all these things now sorted out. So what happened in these magnetic centers inside the molecules? Because now we can follow, follow up. For entire molecule, we have all the data. So we check the quantum signatures from the center to the one of the arms. And it appears that the center basically has a peak, the arm has a dip. How they change? They change gradually also here, but in the red arrow I show here is the point where the intersections happen between this and this. There is an interaction. So how they interact, in order to understand, we just pull it up, the first one and the, 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 the lower one, so that we can check what's happened here. So this one is appear as this peak, this one is the dip, and then mathematically we just sum it, we got this structure. And then we compare with what we measure, it appears exactly the same or very similar. So we know that they have kind of a convolution is happening at the boundary. And similar way, all other five lobes we see the same way. In the same patterns, what we find is that when we look at between the different arms, they also interact at the spin at the boundary, similar like before, I show with the red arrow. And now we have two signatures here. I'm sorry, this red arrow is in the wrong place. It should be here. So if you sum this box and this box, you should get this one in between. And that is what happened. So we figure out that, in fact, we have six separate uh, the spin centers, and they interact and, and very smoothly within the entire molecules. In fact, I don't have time here to show you, but we have beautiful uh, the condo maps and Q maps of entire system. So now we realize that we probably will be able to use that by changing the different length of these molecular motors or by, by rotating this, we change all the conformation. We maybe play around to get, for example, possibilities of like uh, entanglement. Of course, we haven't seen the entanglement or not sure yet, but we are, that's what uh, the plan for the next step. All right, so what are the future prospects along this direction? So it's possible, we have already demonstrated that uh, molecular machines do the solid state devices. It may be possible. We, we are trying to work right now on very, a simple level of uh, metallic substrate, but we know that we can deposit on, on the silicon and we can make them bind. Self-assembly is the next issue that we have to deal with. But that is one of the uh, uh, potential. Now, even for the normal molecules can function different way materials, these are the molecular machines like motors. We can control their operations. So there is a possibility that we will be able to extend this for using the, the devices. We can also use a plat uh, the machine as a platform for potential spintronics applications, right? So now we have a very complex magnetic system and we can control by rotating, changing. Every change you see here, it alters electronic structures, so the, its magnetic properties. And also the machines, in addition, maybe if we can use for entanglement, then probably also for the uh, qubit as a quantum information science. So all I want to say as a final is that creative ideas, the sky is the limit. So what we are doing is we are bringing in of the uh, so diverse possibility that it already exists in the nature into our hands and trying to improve uh, this and try to use for the humankind. So that's, with that, I want to uh, summarize. I have presented it for a molecular motor, which is, uh, we call it the machine, because it's a rotary part, it's a specially designed. I also show you that we can detect the mechanical portion in a detail as by means of the chiral propellers and uh, I also show you a network of molecular machines. Then we can also sense how charge and the energy is transferred. We can detect into the molecular motor. This will be useful to check not just for the motor, also for the molecular cars, which I'm not going to present it today. And also for the, um, we may be able to use that as a magnetic 
molecules by having uh, the, the magnetic atoms inside the molecular model. With that, finally, I want to thank to my students and former members for my group who has contributed to all this work uh, when I'm giving you this, uh, this talk, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Saul. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions or comments, so please go ahead. I, I, have, a, I have a question, if you allow me to, to do it. Uh, in the design of the, uh, of the molecular motors, uh, what's the, uh, I mean, uh, in the selection of the kind of atoms that you will use for each part of the, of the, of the motors, uh, what's the role of um, uh, VFT calculations there? Um, so we work as a group when we design. We first uh, think about a realistic uh, possibility we call it that this is the techno mimetic molecules. And when we discuss uh, the chemist, Guino will say, okay, that's possible to synthesize this and that. And normally the chemist likes to add a lot of things, which is, uh, we don't want it. Uh, and they said, no, please, uh, you know, reduce that and this and that. And then we want to check, we do calculate uh, calculations. So like in the case of molecular car, I have not presented it. We have to check whether it will stay uh, properly not interacting with the substrate in order to move, for example. So we do the, uh, uh, the simulations. And then uh, after getting the model, after the synthesis, we test. And then we go back to the drawing board to improve. So it's the iterative process. Right. We, it requires a very close a collaboration uh, which is fine. Uh, I love wine uh, in, in, in France, and uh, so. Thank you, sir. Any other question or comment? Yes. We have a, I think that we have a microphone there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Professor. Thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, I was wondering if you are also moving this direction towards uh, Mm, enabling all this uh, manipulation on a, on a liquid phase. Uh, thank you for the questions. That is much more complicated. So uh, we should be able to do that because they are liquid phase STMs. But the first task for us is just to understand how they work. So in a liquid, you have existence of the solvent molecules around it, and they are charged species, which are moving in and out. It produces a lot of noise. <clears throat> and so that uh, to detect the dynamics, or sorry, understanding the dynamic is much more difficult. So that's the reason we try to isolate in ultra high vacuum environment and at the low temperature. Now, if we want to use it for the solid state devices, that's fine, we need to work in this, the clean environment. But the temperature, of course, should not be five Kelvin, which is, we can transform it. But eventually, to understand how these things work with much larger scale, we have to go to the liquid and also the room temperature. Because eventually, at some point, we want to understand how things work in our bodies, right? So, but this is uh, a little bit longer road, to our road, to be honest. Uh, Yes, it should be possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for such an interesting and inspiring talk. Thank you. I wonder if you have tried to emulate uh, ATPs. Uh, you mean I have tried? So I was planning to try that some time ago, maybe like a, a 10 years ago. But we basically started with much, uh, much cleaner. Um, so far, not, no. I, the, the answer is no, not yet. The, the, one of the thing is that the lipid, the membranes, are in fact, they are insulating. 
as far as I know, <laughs> and they also think. So we have to use like, you know, not the SCM, but AFM, and uh, an atomic force microscope. And, uh, and so we were thinking about that at some point to actually to, to play around to understand the process. But we haven't done that yet. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm not familiar with molecular machines, but uh, I don't know how you can isolate uh, only one molecule or something like that to, to, to make all the experiment. Oh, you mean uh, how can we get just one molecule? Yep. Okay, we actually don't have just one molecule, of course. Uh, we have very few molecules, is more correct. So we deposit, we can also deposit by drop casting with a very uh, diluted solution. Then we have a solvent molecules on the surface. Even if we heat it up, they still remain. They are molecules, they can complicate our measurements. So what we do in all of our experiments that I presented today, we deposit with, through the thermal evaporations. It's like a nuts and it's like a molecular beam epitaxy, okay? So you, you heat it up. And uh, we deposit the very small amount, uh, the very short time, and so that we can find the one molecule and then you have to go into some area in another molecule. So that we can do the experiment one molecule at a time in the area. We don't want the next one is close to it, so that they will start interacting. That will complicate our experiment. When we want to have a self-assemble, like the one that I show, the network, then we deposit it a little more. Then you have a well-ordered arrangement. Then that's becoming a different uh, experiment. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for your nice talk. I want to know if it's also possible to induce uh, linear movement? Yes. So I have not presented it today, the, the linear movement. We have developed um, things like uh, nanocars, for example. We have even competed in the first nanocar race and also the recently the second nanocar race, but second, we did not win. <laughs> so, but that's fine. It's for, it's for fun and it's also for the public outreach. So when we are developing the, uh, I don't know if you to see, I can uh, quickly show you five or more slides based on this answer. Could you uh, give me the uh, more screen, please? Excuse me, can you switch that to the uh, computer? So this was the, uh, the first nanocar race uh, uh, and we call it the nano car race. This was fun, that little molecular machines that we want to uh, move the linear uh, <coughs> as a car, and we developed, looks like a car. And so what we did was, in this case, we choose a wheel, it is called a Cuga Bitterail wheel, and then, uh, and then my colleague, Eric Mason from uh, Ohio University, he synthesized that. And then we edit the H frame, and then we slot in these wheels. It's natural slot in. So this is basically not one molecule. It's a five molecules uh, associated. So the wheels are free, and then we have a charge point so that we can use electric field to push or pull to drive the car. And, uh, and, and then we model it uh, with the density function of theory to see that it will sustain the, the attraction from the substrate, because we don't want this, the axis, to be bent and bind to the substrate. And it turns out that they are stable, as shown here. This is a very huge calculations. And then it has a charge point. And so what we could do, we can, uh, uh, you can see that the cars are already moving at liquid nitrogen temperatures, like only the traces. Only when the car gets stuck with the defects, it stopped. And, and so that we can image the whole four wheel. By chance, um, uh, the car is, uh, it's no longer here, uh, sorry, yes. One wheel is broken, then it stopped. 
and, and so, yes, we can, uh, we can apply the electric field, uh, we can move the car, and, and this is just giving the example. So this kind of a linear movement you can do, but there are a few things that we need to consider is that uh, um, the binding to the substrate has to be not so strong. And then uh, right now, most people are using electric field so that we need to have a kind of a dipole uh, or, or conf configuration has to be put into the your molecular device so that if you apply the electric field either positive or negative, depends on that, you can, you can uh, in the push-pull, you can drive. But self-driven, what people are interested in is not just going following this, but using the chemical energy. It's like Professor Faringa has shown. That kind of things are also trying to, people are trying to develop. So this is an entire field of uh, type of the molecular machines, which is a linear, linear movement. Do I answer your question? Thank you. What's the risk? Thank you. Um, yes, I'm wondering if there have been in implementations of other um, spectroscopic techniques into the STM chamber, such as, for example, Raman signal or any other spectroscopic uh, signals? So, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, similar to the Raman is a vibrational spectroscopy that I have shown you that we can measure the vibrational signature of the single molecules which was already first demonstrated by uh, Professor Wilson Ho. And we show here a case of the ferrocene. Um, if you want to combine with the uh, laser to get the real Raman, like tip enhanced Raman, which is totally another area. And uh, some of my colleagues are working into that direction. And I don't see why not you put the molecular machines underneath, and you can see the, all the signatures. But uh, we haven't done that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Domingo. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really impressive what you can do. Uh, from your presentation, you mentioned that the spin of the electrons played uh, an important role in determining the movement of the machines. Is there a way for you to control the spin of the electrons that, that did inject into the molecular machine? Um, so your question is uh, to get spin into the molecular machine? Yes. Oh. To so manipulate. I have, what I have shown you is that we get a spin into the molecular machine. That's why we can detect. But uh, you, uh, what, the, the, that's, a, that's the question, or no, how to control the direction of the spin? Yes, exactly. Okay. What I have shown you is, uh, is the spin, but uh, the, the question is, is a very important question uh, because can we control the direction? In here, we don't. Uh, condo means that the spin is flipping back and forth any way random with interacting it. And so, in fact, many cases, we don't want condo if you want to have a, a magnetic molecule. You should not show condo. But uh, we have already checked, and we can orient the spin by depositing a very thin uh, uh, iron. So we have deposited from the iron uh, islands, uh, one atomic layer thick uh, little islands. And then we deposit molecular motors on top of that. In, in fact, they just go and find and they stick there. They love iron. Then we no longer see the condo effect. It just disappears. It's becoming a magnetic. Now how the spins are oriented inside, we have not uh, uh, checked yet. It's uh, ongoing, uh, the projects, but this is very interesting for us as well. All right. Is there any other question or comment? Yes. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very, very interesting. Uh, as I have understood it, uh, all this comes from density functional theory. Uh, all your pre-calculations are based on that. What I'm wondering is, can you predict the condo effect or the condo resonance before, as you're doing your DFT calculations, or does that come after the actual experimentation? 
So the density, it's a very good question, thank you. So density functional theory normally give us just electronic structure, which is, and also the structural properties. If you use a geometrically relaxed, the binding strength, if you use like, uh, we have to consider like Vanderwaal interactions as well. However, it doesn't give you the information like a condo. We get the uh, spin information, of course, if you use a spin DFT. So in order to, to understand the condo, you have to use a different types of the calculation on top of the density functional theory. So we basically take the electronic structures and all the spin structures results from the density functional theory, and then we have to use the condo, which is analytical calculations, different types of calculations, in order to explain what's happening. Okay, so. And maybe you can develop this one day. <laughs> Any other question or comment? If, if not, uh, let's thank So for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. We want, we want to give So a small diploma just for, to recognize his contribution to the, to the meeting. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sajo. It was very nice. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and uh, I'll see you around.